Very quickly to you, Richard, something that came from your presentation and um, maybe um, would, you would want to expound on this. Contributions growth is falling and many are wondering what's, uh, what are the factors you believe are leading to this uh, decline? Uh, briefly, um, the main factor is our business model. Uh, we've extracted the juices of the business it also reflects that uh, employment hasn't been, formal employment has not been growing uh, as, um, as high as it previously was. Uh, we notice that because not very many new companies are registering. Uh, the other one is that our growth rates uh, in value has been largely around an increase in salaries. Uh, and some companies, because of the hard times, have not been increasing their salaries as much as possible. So it's a, fact, it's a, it's a moment of... Um, of factors, uh, largely driven by the fact that the model is, um, uh, is becoming mature. Uh, the relationship management model, which we use for uh, improving uh, compliance, also has its own limitations. Um, one of the things, as you know, is that we need uh, the law to help us in um, making sure that uh, we collect uh, money. Uh, and that law, as you know, is part of the amendments that are part of the uh, because the fines are very small, so people don't uh, really take you seriously when you say we're going to take you through court and you'll have to pay a fine. So I think that it's all those factors uh, which basically have uh, brought down the, uh, the rates. Uh, we are very confident that with the, uh, the amendments in the Act, that should give the fund a little bit more scope uh, in terms of coverage and it will also bring a little bit of scope in terms of compliance and giving uh, the fund a bigger stick to be able to deal with the defaulting employers. Thank you, Richard. Uh, speaking to the law and uh, the bill that is in Parliament, um, Agnes, quick question. Where are we at? What next? Because your members, and a lot of these questions, I think 99% of the questions really focused on the bill, and you want to tell us how far we have come. Um, thanks, Maurice, and good morning, members, and whoever is following us. Um, that's a very good question. I, be, I recall during, um, at the height of the pandemic, when our members were really appealing to, to the fund to release some of the contributions, we repeatedly told our members that as a statutory body, the fund is established by law, our hands were tied, and that we could not do much until the law is amended by parliament. So where we are right now is parliament is considering um, the reports from its committees, those of gender and finance. And once that is done, if parliament agrees with the, present, the proposals that have been presented by those committees, parliament will pass the, the bill. So we expect that the bill will be passed. Now, when the bill is passed, it's got to be assented to by the president. Um, so it is after the president has assented to the bill and that assent would come with a commencement date as well, that we will then be able to enforce the provisions of the amendments that are currently being discussed. So we are waiting, one, for Parliament to conclude its deliberations and hopefully pass the bill, and thereafter, most importantly, for the presidential assent. And then we'll be keeping our members updated on the progress thereafter. Thank you. Richard, I'll, I'll come to questions uh, that have been sent to us online, and um, they, they really come across for all of you. So I'll begin with you, Richard. Miles Abdu says, in SSF, you say that those who have saved for 10 years and above or are 45 years will be allowed 10% to withdraw from their savings. When is this taking effect? I think uh, that's still a subject to discussion. I'm sure you heard in the minister's uh, pre presentation. There's still two uh, minds to that. Uh, the parliament has come up with some suggestions. In fact, there are more uh, midterm access suggestions that have come through, including one on a minority report, which basically uh, is offering almost 70% for people uh, who are disabled, and I think 40% for those who have not worked for three years. So there's a lot of discussions going on that, and therefore no final decision has been made on terms of the midterm access. However, whatever uh, decision is reached by parliament, uh, I believe that as a fund we will be able to implement uh, given um, uh, that the process that uh, Agnes has gone through of uh, basically uh, presidential accent for the bill to be uh, implemented. 
Richard Okech Kaleb says, I am an active contributor to NSSF for the last 11 years, since 2009. However, what I don't understand is why every economist, uh, every economist predicts very low interest for members during the financial year ended June 30th, 2020. Well, Didn't the fund do business uh, um, well, I, for I, the nine months before COVID? I, I, is that Okech? <laughs> yes. Mr. Okech? Mr. Okech, I'm sure you are pleasantly surprised that uh, in spite of the bad performance, uh, because of the resilience of the fund, the fact that we've got quite uh, a large spread uh, between the three asset classes, uh, that in spite of all that, uh, in fact, we have managed to give a double-digit uh, interest rate, uh, and that double-digit is 10.75%, and I hope that uh, members now will be happy with that. Of course, and I can say this publicly, uh, if, the, um, if the pandemic hadn't come, I believe that uh, we would have had a very good year, uh, almost akin to the record year that we had of 15% to our members. So, unfortunately, COVID did bring uh, a break because if you look at the stock markets, especially those in Kenya, uh, stock prices for the banks had almost uh, uh, got to 50 shillings uh, per share. They came down to about 30 shillings per share. So, and that followed through in, 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 within the whole stock exchange. Uh, so if those gains uh, in the stock exchange had been recorded onto our books, I believe that we would have been able to pay uh, almost 15% to our members. All right. Thanks, Richard. Let's come to Agnes. Uh, Agnes, there's a couple of questions. You've spoken to some in your opening statement on the bill, uh, but just one particular section of John Boscombe's question on when the law is passed, how long will it take for members to access uh, their money based on the different benefits uh, it speaks to? Thanks, Boris. So, like I said earlier, when the bill is passed, we expect that there will be a commencement date. So, it will be clear. It will state that the changes take effect on date X. That is one. Two, in the proposals, for example, there is um, a clause that will enable the board to come up with new products, etc., that will require some work on our side, which we've already started on. For example, some of the new benefits that have been suggested, the unemployment benefit, the medical, the, 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 the education, etc. We will have to come up with regulations. Earlier, the chairman mentioned eligibility criteria to determine how our members will be accessing those benefits. So we've already started on that work. I can't give an exact response now because it's all dependent on what eventually is included in the bill but we will keep our members updated we are very conscious of the urgency of our members needs and uh, we will definitely be looking to roll out these new products as soon as possible thank you all right agnes uh, sendege patrick and uh, kalulu ronald ask a similar question uh, is there a plan of allowing mem members to access loans from banks with their benefits as security uh, thanks maurice that in fact speaks to the proposed benefits that we expect to be coming up with. The loan guarantee in this case, I suppose, would be collateral for the members to use uh, their contributions as collateral. It is still one of the issues being discussed. It is not yet concluded at this point. So again, it's all dependent on what parliament passes in that bill. We are all waiting, like our members. And so we will work with the final uh, final bill as passed by parliament. So if that is included in there, then definitely it will be available. If not, it could be one of the proposals that the board may be considered within the mandate that they will be granted in the same act. So let us wait and see how the final act, if passed, will look like, and we'll definitely come back to our members on this. For now, it is not provided for in the current law. Mm -hmm. All right, Gerald, um, in terms of TV time, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, I see we have more time we may have with our members on the social media platforms. Uh, but Gerald, to you, there is a question from Barozi Allen. Is there a plan, and actually there are two questions here. Uh, Barozi Allen, is there a plan to develop a policy of remitting back to the savers the interest to their individual accounts so they can also annually invest their, this interest as we continue to save? And secondly, you want NSSF or you want farms to remit NSF contributions promptly, but I wonder how you can help these same farms get back in business. Okay, <clears throat> let me start with the first one. Um, I think, I mean, Agnes could have actually answered this question better because she's a lawyer. Currently, the kind of benefits that we pay 
uh, are indicated in the NSSF Act. So as it starts, we cannot get the interest that we declare and then give it back to members for them to make their own investment. But I know there are a couple of, uh, there are a couple of uh, financial products in the market. I know people have taken advantage of unit trusts. I know people have, have invested in circles or investment clubs. I think those financial products do, do still exist in the market. But as it stands, with the current scheme of NSSF, we can only pay back someone's money through the six benefits indicated in the NSSF Act. To your second question, what have we done uh, to kind of impact society after COVID uh, you know, happened? I think re in Richard's presentation, he indicated that we have invested in the, in, the, in, the, in the yield fund. Together with the EU, we partnered and created a private equity fund. It is almost 20 million euros. Uh, the EU put in 10, we also put in some money. We, we managed to attract a couple of other, other investors. As it stands today, almost 6 million euros has been, sorry, 6 million dollars has been deployed in seven different investing companies. The number of jobs, the number of people that are actually benefiting in terms of jobs created come to almost 3,000. That is impact for you. But then, again, in terms of what the fund has done, <coughs> We announced an amnesty or a deferral at the beginning of COVID. It was very public. As it stands today, we have 1,730 employers that have benefited and an average of 22.5 billion Uganda shillings in contributions that would have been coming to NSSF, but because of the deferral, they are not coming to us. So for me, I believe that is impact enough. Of course, the debate still remains. Maybe we could have done more but at least we've done something and we believe we can continue going forward. Thank you, Gerald. Richard, um, to you, there's a question from um, Cyrus. And Cyrus's question is similar to another lady, Sarah Chobe, on uh, Twitter, who asked, why is it that you don't process people's benefits on time when they apply after qualifying? Um, that, that's, uh, that's a very uh, specific question. It might refer to one or two individuals uh, whose requirements may not have been either provided in time or we needed some time to be able to identify them. However, the numbers I put up on this during my presentation is that on average, we pay our members uh, seven, uh, under seven working days. Uh, and uh, if you look at that average, uh, there will be members that we pay within three days, within two days, even within a day, uh, depending on how easy it is for their uh, information to be processed. But there will be some people who will take a little bit of time. But I would say that those are very, very specific. And what I would like to uh, basically um, implore from uh, the person who's asked the question, please send us those specifics. We'll investigate them and uh, come back to, 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 to them uh, to be able to decide whether uh, those were... Uh, it, it's not a systematic problem. It is an individual problem. Thank you very much, Richard. And I know that some of our TV partners will be switching us off right now. We still have some questions. So if you're watching and you'd want to continue with this conversation, we still have a few more questions. Um, please do log on to the NSSF Facebook page or their Twitter handle at NSSFUG. You will be able to follow the rest of this conversation off TV. And so you're free to join us. And I also remind you, our members, that we will send you an SMS uh, or an email. Uh, for you to share your feedback on uh, today's annual members meeting. So do join us. All right, so we'll continue with this. Richard, um, your question, a question here from um, Yasser, who says, what's your idea of affordable housing with respect to social security? And are there modalities for a contributor to secure a mortgage using the NSSF savings? Okay, so I know that this is a question I get confronted with all the time. Um, the fund's mandate doesn't really fall, uh, fall around uh, social housing. I think that mandate belongs to the Ministry uh, of Finance. Uh, but I can, all, I can say this. Uh, from the numbers that we see, uh, in order to sort of generate an affordable housing, you are looking at a figure between maybe three, 30 million to 50 million shillings. Currently, the houses that we've been able to uh, provide to the market uh, we are in the process of providing to the market, the figure will come to about 100 uh, and so million shillings, which means that there is a disparity of about between 50 and uh, 80 million shillings uh, between what is, uh, 
what you'd call affordable and what we are able to put onto the market? And the answer lies in uh, two things. One is uh, its infrastructure. Many of the projects that we implement as a fund, we need to build the infrastructure right from scratch because uh, government hasn't provided infrastructure in all the places. Secondly, land. As soon as the fund gets involved in a land transaction, the premiums that are put on that land are quite high and we end up getting a price that is perhaps outside of the market. So if those two items were removed out of the uh, a house that we are constructing or the houses that we construct, we would be able to shed almost 40 or 50 percent of the price and therefore be able to come into the affordable uh, housing range. So my, 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 um, you know, my advice uh, to people is that uh, if, if, if you, you are in a position uh, to get uh, us, uh, NSSF, uh, free land, uh, well not free land, but land available from either government, uh, and then we were also able to get uh, infrastructure put in those places, then the fund will be able to, do, to, to, to generate uh, houses uh, which are affordable uh, to our members. But on the second question uh, about them being able to borrow uh, against their funds, again, this is a question that uh, the theme has been continued, uh, that Agnes and, and also uh, Gerald talked about. Uh, this is largely due to uh, the rules that are coming in uh, after the amendments have been passed. All right. Uh, let me come to you, Agnes. A couple of questions here, and they are similar, both from Ronald and uh, Ambayo, who says, uh, Ronald said, I filed several whistleblower cases, but nothing happened. What's your policy on whistleblowers? Ambayo says, this meeting comes in handy. We need answers for and why NSSF response to whistleblowers platform is not very effective, and I and many others are not happy on how matters reported are handled. Thanks, Maurice. Before I respond to that question, I would like to make a few comments in addition to the questions you had asked Richard. One, on the turnaround time for processing of benefits. Um, what we've shared um, in the presentation that Richard gave, the seven days, is an average. We have different types of benefits, each with its own unique requirements. So we have the age benefit, for example, withdrawal. That is straightforward. It's clear that when, once you clock the designated age, 50 or 55, you can get the benefit, even in one day. It's that quick. But we have unique benefits, like the survivor's benefit, uh, which is uh, available to a member's family after they've passed on, or the invalidity benefit. These require a little more work to verify and validate the information available, the documentation. So for example, for a survivor's benefit, you'll have documents like the letters of administration that have got to be verified through the courts of law. So definitely that will take a little longer, maybe 13 days, two, 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 two weeks, a month or so. So just uh, the, the, the point here is there are different categories. The number shared is an average. So we will handle uh, the cases as they are they are, they are presented to us, but if there's any specific concern, like Richard has said, that could be flagged for attention. And then, um, very quickly, on the affordable housing question, again, it's a debate that the fund, the board, and management continues to have because it keeps coming up from our members. Um, Gerard will probably speak to it. Our mandate as the fund, the law is very clear, and again, it was on the presentation that Richard shared. We're supposed to collect, invest, and give our members a return. So the return is dependent on the investments you make. Unfortunately, unfortunately to date, the affordable housing question, again, Gerard will probably speak to this, shows that there could be a decline in the return that the members get if that was chosen as a specific investment option. However, not all hope is lost in this sense. Pending conclusion of the fund's mandate, whether to give a good return, whether to deliberately focus on having social impact, or have the winning combination of social impact plus a good return. That is the ideal. In the interim, the question the member asked earlier about a loan guarantee, that could be the interim solution. So if the law passed and members are able to use their savings, for example, as collateral to access a mortgage, that could be the response to some of our members' needs. Then speaking to the question about whistleblower, we have a whistleblower policy. It's quite, um, it's, it's in place. 
we receive reports, we attend to them, investigations are done, we ensure that we guarantee our confidentiality and protect the whistleblower. So if there's any case that hasn't been addressed, we request that it is resubmitted so that we can investigate and see why those particular cases haven't been dealt with. We have a specific channel, which I believe will be shared on our platforms, social media platforms, so members know the channel. Please resubmit that particular issue for consideration. We, we are unable to explain why that could have happened. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'll quickly run to Gerald. Gerald, there is a question from uh, Moses Isula Otai. How come your operation costs stayed the same? And are you fair to say that in the first two quarters of the fund, never made profit, and other than the moratorium for banks not to pay profits, what happened to the bonds and treasury bills? None of those were well matured to yield profit. I think you spoke to the second part earlier, but you can answer the first question. Okay. <clears throat> Let me just emphasize the point made by Richard in his presentation, and I think the minister also reiterated the same. We made a total revenue of 1.471 trillion. Out of that, 1.398 was income that we got from treasury bonds. So to his question, I think we actually performed well in the, in the fixed income assets class, which is basically uh, the treasury bonds. Now, in terms of costs, <coughs> the best way to measure how inefficient a pension fund is you, you, you normally, the, t the ratio we use is, we, co we call it an expense ratio. So in Richard's presentation, he actually explained that the cost, sorry, the, the, our expense ratio as at the end of June 2020 stood at 1.19%. When you compare that one to last year, it was 1.23%. So that, that is actually an improvement. If you, if you come to my area, which is investment, the cost of the investment department, which has 30 people to the fund, is two basis points. That is 0.02%. When you compare the market today, some fund managers actually charge as high as 1%, and Martin is here, I can speak to that. I know we pay our fund managers 16 basis points, but basically in terms of costs, I think we are one of the most efficient uh, uh, pension funds for that asset, for, for, the, uh, for the kind of assets that we own. All right. I don't have a lot of time. You'd, it would have been nice. I know uh, Agnes kind of wanted you to say something on the affordable housing. Let me ask you this final question for you, uh, Gerald. What happens to the interest? This is from Dennis uh, Wonasolo, who says, what happens to the interest or dividend that the banks didn't give? Will they give it in the future? And if the banks do in the future, will the fund share it with its members? Yes. <laughs> I, think, I think the quick answer to the question is yes. Uh, so basically, let me give some context. We got, uh, a, the banks in Uganda got a directive from the central bank to stay their dividend payments. We know for a fact that a bank like Stanbic Bank was well positioned, actually is well positioned to pay the dividend. What some banks did was to basically defer. I know in Kenya, we got uh, banks like Equity Bank who had earlier made decisions to pay dividends, we seen their dividends. So in terms of impact of the decision on dividends, we lost about 20 billion, but that is income that we're probably likely to see in the future. So the quick answer to his question is that dividends that have been deferred will actually be paid, and that would be income to the member. Thank you very much, Gerald. Uh, Maurice, yes, can I quickly this. share the whistleblower, the yes, question? Please. The whistleblower could kindly log their complaints to www.nssfug.julisha. Julisha is J U. L I S H A dot org. That is the avenue through which we receive the whistleblower complaints. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much, Agnes. So yeah, Richard, but I think if they go to our website as well, all that information is there. All right. Um, and the final questions to you, Richard. I have two questions for you, but uh, these speak to the NSSF app, uh, the NSSF Go app. Please do download it if you haven't. And uh, Richard will be speaking quite a bit on this because these questions, Richard, uh, speak to the app and it would be nice to hear your feedback because um, Ken uh, Kirumira uh, says, is it possible to allow passive members staying out of the country start saving again with the fund? Uh, currently the app, that's the, NTV, uh, the NSSF Go app, sorry. Currently the app only allows someone on MTN or Airtel mobile money. Actually, yeah, that, that surprises me because we've, um, about three, four, maybe six months ago, 
we did launch the Visa card, uh, so you can actually pay with your Visa. You might not be able to use the app, but certainly you can use the website uh, using the uh, the Visa card. So yes, we can we can take we do take contributions from ab abroad. We call it the Diaspora product, and uh, that is available for people who are our members and would like to continue saving, and they can do that either using a visa or they can even transfer their money uh, through the banking system. A related question from Chisito Andrew who says, uh, if, say, a non-member friend of mine wishes to enroll through the NSSF Go app and asks me the following, uh, basically he's asking you for these answers. How many times a month can I deposit savings? If I'm 50 and I wish to save up to 55, am I entitled to access uh, medium term uh, before I'm 55? And how long can I access again after the first time of withdrawal? What requirements do I need to access funds if I'm a voluntary contributor? Okay, so that actually all talks to a voluntary contribution. Uh, basically, after you have reached the age of 50 and you are no longer in formal employment, you are allowed to continue to, uh, to uh, contribute uh, as a voluntary contributor. And you can contribute as many times as you want. Uh, and you can also make partial withdrawals uh, whenever you want. Um, I think the law allows us uh, once every two years, but I think that w law, we, we've sort of wavered it for our operations, and the members can draw as many times as they want. But certainly that is av available uh, for our members uh, who would like to contribute voluntarily. We are hoping that with the new law, uh, we'll have more flexibility as well, even for people who are below the age of 50 and out of employment. Finally, Richard, um, we really have run out of time. James Cato says... Is it now possible to be both a mandatory and a voluntary, or have both a mandatory and voluntary plan with the fund? Very good, very good question. No, not at the moment. The law doesn't allow us uh, to do that. Uh, you can only become voluntary under two circumstances. One, you've stopped contributing mandatorily. Uh, that's the first one. The second one is that you work for a company that chooses uh, to voluntarily register themselves, and therefore you can contribute under that. So. Uh, a lot of people have gone around that little problem by creating their own company and contributing under that, but I don't really want to know. Does that also answer the question on if I wanted to increase my savings? Yes. The, the, so currently in the current law, I can't do that? You can't do that, but you can do it if you register All under... Right your own company, and then contribute under it. Smart, but, as, but as I said, I smart, don't want to know. Smart guidance. All right. Thank you very much, Richard, Agnes, and Gerald. We want to thank you for your uh, time this morning. Please do take your seats.